In set theory, given two small sets A and B, we define their Cartesian product A cross B to be the set of elements of the form um, little a comma little b, where little a is in A and little b is in B. You could say this is precisely the defining property of the Cartesian product of sets. From this, we can derive what functions um, of the form A cross B to C look like. For example, we could deduce that because elements of a cross b are by definition those of the form little a comma little b, to define f it suffices to define f on the pairs little a comma little b. In type theory we do the opposite, that is declare that to define f it suffices to define f on pairs a comma b. And then we can deduce that every element of a times b is equal to a pair little a comma little b. Let's break that down in more detail. So type theory takes a different approach. In sort of a Haskellian view of functions as first class citizens, it says that what really matters about the Cartesian product is how functions out of it are defined. Why should that matter as opposed to how elements are defined? Well, the Cartesian product serves a very special purpose. It is the left adjoint of exponentiation, by which we mean the creation of functions. What does this mean specifically? Recall that while we could have defined functions on, of multiple variables, that wasn't necessary. By currying, a function that takes inputs from A and B to yield an element in C can be thought of as a function from A to B to C. For example, if we say that the function sends inputs A and B to C, we can think of the curried function as sending um, the element A to a function which sends the element B to C. Sort of think of it like applying A first and then B. But did you catch that? We just said something that wasn't really well defined. We implied that a function that takes inputs from A and B to yield an element in C was a well-defined statement. But it isn't yet. The curried function A to B to C by definition takes an input from A and yields an element or function in B to C. It doesn't take one element from A and one element from B and return an element in C. The Cartesian product type serves to make the statement a function that takes inputs from A and B to yield an element in C well defined. Indeed, this statement pretty much tells us how to define the Cartesian product. Giving elements A and A and B and B define an element A, little a comma little b in A cross B. Now, keeping in mind that we want functions a cross b to c to be equivalent to their curried counterpart, counterpart a to b to c, we say that given g from a to b to c, define f from a cross b to c by um, taking the pair little a comma little b to g first applied to little a and the result of that applied to little b like we were discussing before. We just said something, though, again, that has a subtle implication. We implied that to define f from a cross b to c, it sufficed to define values on the pairs little a comma little b. To be clear, this is an actual constraint we are com um, imposing in our definition. It is not a derivable fact. Like in, um, in set theory, how the defining property was that the elements of a cross b were of the form like pairs little a comma little b. This is the defining property of the Cartesian product in type theory, that it suffices to say how a function acts on pairs little a comma little b. Indeed, if we did not make this a constraint, there's no reason to believe that it would suffice to define f only on pairs. For we did not declare, unlike in set theory, that every element in A cross B was of the form little a comma little b. So just to recap, while in set theory we define the Cartesian product as the set of elements of the form little a comma little b, in type theory we are defining functions, in particular stating that to define a function A cross B to C, it suffices to define it on pairs little a comma little b. 
This statement is called the recursion principle for products in type theory. From this recursion principle, we can prove the uniqueness principle, which is subtle in its own right. This is the proposition, emphasis on proposition, that every element in a cross b is equal to a pair little a comma little b. Why is this so subtle? Well, this is due to how the identity type is defined in type theory. So let's say we are asserting that x in a cross b is equal to the pair little a comma little b. In type theory, this means that the type x equals a comma b is inhabited, meaning there is an element p in the type x equals a comma b. At this point, it is actually beneficial maybe to think of homotopy type, type theory. In homotopy type theory, types are spaces up to homotopy, and elements of a type are points on that space. Equality is the type whose elements are pads on that space. All of this is to set up what I think is a really intuitive idea. Two elements of a type are equal when there is a path connecting them. Now, it is immediate to see the subtlety I was alluding to before. Just because x and a comma b are equal, it doesn't mean that they are the same element, just that there exists a path connecting them. And yes, when we are talking about sets, the type theoretic and set theoretic definitions are equivalent. Spelled out, if we were to regard a set as a space, then it is totally disconnected. The only pads are the constant ones from an element to itself. So equality in the sense of type theory collapses to the idea that two elements are equal if and only if they are definitionally the same. The advantage of the type theoretic definition, however, is that it generalizes the set theoretic one. I've been studying homotopy theory on my own for a little bit now, and I've always heard that we only care about things up to homotopy. Um, even in general, we, re we rarely care about things up to strict equality. It is far more useful to consider things that are equal up to something, whether that be isomorphism, homeomorphism, homotopy, um, natural isomorphism. For some reason, it was only through unpacking the product type though, that I understood how ideas from homotopy theory play into logic. As we just saw, we have the ability to specify how strong a notion of equality we want to work with. And in case you were wondering, here is the familiar adjunction that we were working hard to define. The above discussion could essentially be described as saying the definition of a product type is such that it is the left adjoint to exponentiation.